Hello, welcome to the first video about the history of electricity retail. In this lecture, we'll first go through one story of electricity retail from the east coast of the United States. It was one of the first places in the world to develop and propagate an electricity grid. Next, we'll review the role of regulation and subsequent deregulation in electricity retail. The electricity grid developed differently in different regions but most have some specific general trends. I will go over a US example to illustrate these trends. Let's start in 1882, when Thomas Edison set up a small power plant in New York City. It was called Pearl Street Station. The plant's goal was to power Edison's illuminating light bulbs. So the company was called the Edison Electric Illuminating Company. This power plant supplied electricity for some parts of New York, uh, in Manhattan, in the late 1800s. It burned coal to run steam turbines and supplied over 10,000 lamps with electricity at its peak. Quite quickly, Edison's electrical company grew larger and absorbed the gas business side of the company. In the late 19th century, it was promoting direct current, while other companies, such as Westinghouse, were promoting alternating currents. In the end, it lost this war of the currents because alternating current was just more efficient to transport back then. And as a small side note here, Edison and his company never actually killed an elephant with AC current just to scare the public away from AC. Although an elephant was executed by electrification in that time period, it was not to promote or demonize an electrical current. Edison Electric Illuminating Company continued absorbing its competitors and other suppliers. By the 1920s, it was the largest electricity supplier in its region. By this point, it had become clear to users and suppliers alike that it didn't make sense to have more than one electricity grid to supply an entire area. This image mostly shows telephone wiring, another network product, but it also drives the home point for electricity too. In addition, many of the generators used to generate electricity benefit a lot from efficiencies of scale. That is a tendency towards higher efficiencies in turning fuel into electricity as generators grow larger. Hence, electricity suppliers continued to grow and grow to the point where they became total monopolies over the region of grid operation. This is when regulators stepped in and slowly turned the entire business into highly regulated private enterprises. Or they bought out companies entirely and made them public. This occurred in many places in the US in the mid 20th century and are how things continue to stand in many parts of the world. By mid century, the grid looked like this with a single company owning generators and supplying a range of customers in the region the retailer had control over the entire supply chain. Since the 1970s, however, there has been a wave of deregulation. By that time, many new generators had popped up, willing to serve electricity for retailers. Additionally, with a fully regulated supply chain, there isn't any incentive to innovate and many other inefficiencies of economy. So the first part to get liberalized was the wholesale generation side, which turned into markets. Note that this is where we depart from New York. Over there, the grandchild of Edison Electric, Consolidated Edison, or Con Edison for short. It continues to maintain its own grid and sell to customers in a regulated monopoly. But in many other countries, especially in Europe and other United States states, we see multiple retailers vying for customers in a more free market and paying to use a common but tightly regulated grid. In these places, the government has separated the grid operation as well and allowed retailers to operate on the grid while paying a usage fee to a regulated or government-owned entity and then sell electricity to the users. In a liberalized retail market, the retailer only controls transactions with the end users and leaves all downstream and upstream operations to other independent parties. This kind of deregulation is great for many reasons. In a liberalized market, retailers compete to offer low prices to consumers. 
Retailers also demand low prices from generators or make their own if it's cheaper. Consumers also get more choice about what to buy and from whom. They get the lowest prices as competition pushes prices down. Innovation is also higher in more competitive markets. But costs are high too. Because the retailer and grid operators are now different and have different interests, we get some issues, for example, transaction costs and more hazard. For example, the retailer might very well like to promote solar panels for its customers, since it can use it to reduce costs. But this causes risk for the grid operator, whose burden is later transferred to customers and taxpayers. Also, the grid operator still needs to be tightly regulated, which costs money. Even with retail deregulated, grid operation remains tightly regulated and has little incentive to innovate as well. Our key takeaways from this lecture are electricity retail grew as a monopolized supply chain and was tightly regulated. In recent times, there has been a wave of deregulation in this space, but many regions still have a long way to go. There are both benefits and costs to deregulation, and nowadays the balance is mostly in favor of deregulation. To learn more about these topics and more, I recommend these papers. The Yakubovich paper reviews the early years of electricity retail in the United States. The Simshauser paper talks about the pros and cons of deregulation, focusing mainly on the cons. The Peppermint's paper reviews market, uh, reviews market liberalization in general for the European Union. And the Sally's and Price paper gives another example of deregulation from the United Kingdom.